Uh, well, let's just say that was pretty amazing. I uh, hope everybody enjoyed that. Um, <clears throat> just on a note about the artist, Tare, I mentioned before we went to break, he's uh, kind of in Bombay Beach. Um, he's involved there with the uh, by by an alley of Bombay Beach, and he's an artist that um, I think did a really good job of encapsulating the ethos of what we're trying to do in this event, which is um, an infusion. Uh, we're bringing together both cultures on the U.S. and the Mexico side of the border and bringing those cultures together, but also bringing those um, uh, vibes together. So that was great. Thank you so much, Tare, for uh, contributing to this effort and sharing that with us. Uh, with that, we're going to jump into the next element of this discussion and we're going to take us through some of the technical issues and some of the ideas behind restoration of the Sea of Cortez and the Colorado River Delta as that relates to Laguna Salada and talk about salt and sea as a whole. So thank you, Rob, for joining us. Um, go ahead. We're going to kind of introduce yourself and then we're going to um, kind of talk a little bit about your background and then kind of introduce this um, section of the project specifically. Yes. Hi, all. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Rob Simpson. I'm director of development for Aegis Inc. Um, my background is project development. Uh, my degrees in uh, business administration, emphasis in finance. Um, and I have about 10 years of working on Southern California water issues, actually about 12, dating back to many issues with the San Francisco Bay Delta area. Um, it was inst interesting to hear some discussion earlier about uh, the um, Westlands irrigation drainage canal, which caused many of the selenium um, issues that we discussed earlier. Um, it's good to see um, both uh, David Mitchell and Roger Allen on uh, the line now. And these are both people that I have drawn upon their vast knowledge uh, in order to essentially conduct a lot of due diligence on this project. Um, with that all said, um, I'm just going to review a little bit of what we discussed the other day and then move into what occurs in the Gulf of California itself. But essentially, the upper portion of the Colorado River Basin is difficult to get a lot of water vapor into or precipitable moisture. A lot of that has to do with the topography of the West. Um, essentially, the coastal mountains provide a barrier to precipitation, which mostly falls along the coast and, and in west of the Central Valley. Um, in order to really get a lot of moisture into the region, even in winter, a, the jet stream in a low has to drop down quite a bit. Moving across this way, um, you have to get across the Great Basin, which does not produce enough moisture to even have a river flowing out of it. And you have a very tall group of mountains over here as well. Um, with that said, and I'm hoping I'm setting up Dr. Mitchell and others on this, I'm going to get rid of this. And we're going to look at water vapor production from within this region. We can um, do a lot of other things. Um but maintaining total water vapor um, production from that region on an annual basis does have an impact on what happens up here. Um, just to let you know, um, the, excuse me, Gulf of California is a rift valley. And as soon as that comes up, okay, consisting of many um, parallel uh, strike slip faults with expansion right lateral um, spreading faults um, that creates a very deep channel here and generally along the western side. Uh, you can just see that 
looking at this. Um, an important aspect for weather impacts that I'm sure Dr. Mitchell will get in later is that the um, Mexican coastal current starting in early June starts to bring up subtropical sort of waters and reaches a critical temp uh, temperature sometime in July. And if that happens early, you tend to get a Arizona monsoon. If it happens late, you tend to get a New Mexico monsoon. And that's discussed in one of the papers that they have written. Uh, it's interesting that in 1984 and um, 1999, we had very large monsoons. And these are essentially graphs of the uh, sea surface temperature anomalies on there. I uh, don't want to step on him too much. Um, but those are critical functions of, let's say, due diligence when talking about what goes on in the northern Gulf. The northern Gulf is actually quite shallow. A lot of this, most of this, is silts and sands deposited by the erosion of the Grand Canyon and essentially the Colorado Plateau. Um, there is a basin down in here, but one of the major issues that we deal with is that at the extreme northern portion in the shallower area, um, we have a counterclockwise rotation of the tidal currents themselves. So the tide comes in and it bounces off of the Sonora Desert, which happens to be the North American plate. Over here is the Pacific plate. And some of the tidal energy is reflected at different frequencies. And it kind of traps a lot of the salinity and sediments depositing it onto the Baja Peninsula itself. That's why a lot of this down here exists. Um, but the existence of the Alto Golfo Biologic Reserve is put in jeopardy because a lot of these waters prior to the uh, Colorado River flows being essentially shut off, flows coming down here were 20 parts per thousand ish. And now salinity in these areas has doubled essentially to about 40 parts per thousand and it is increasing. Um, part of that is the Easter earthquake of 2009 where the fault fractured here, sending a shock wave down to a right transition sort of um, expansion fault. And any and all of you can get on Google Earth and travel back in time to let's say 2009, zoom in on this area and go, okay, this here's 2009. That's 2010. Essentially all this area right here, and you can even see these expansion lines all the way down into this area, sort of subsided due to liquefaction primarily um, by as much as a meter and a half. Some areas greater, some areas less. Um, but an interesting, this, was, this reduces the gradient. So an awful lot of tide comes in this way. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, most of the tide comes in this way and drains back out that way, creating a counterclockwise flow. But the amount of water coming in here is vast and produces a situation where water actually comes into the channels, rises, overflows onto the floodplain, 
and then actually creates erosion by back cutting. This is what you might be familiar with, like Niagara Falls. But if you turn off the clock and go to modern day, all of these channels here extending up to pretty close proximity to Coyote Canal <coughs> are indicative of that back cutting. And these sort of white tainted areas are areas where increased salt is being deposited within the entire region. Um, this is massive salt deposition that occurs even down the Baja Peninsula. This is all relatively recent salt deposition down in this area. So if you go back to 2006 or three, you can walk through this yourselves and determine that Yes, there's a lot of salt being deposited. Um, this is something that really happens in all three of our major inland seas. Okay, so if you look at the, the surface salinity for the Mediterranean, it gets far more saline uh, far to the east. If you look at the surface salinity for uh, the Red Sea, it gets far more saline to the north. If you look at the you know, papers on the subject, for instance, the importance of the deep Gulf of Aqaba is that it helps create bottom water more saline water. This is very similar to the, I think the principles that the Sonoran Institute's gonna talk about in terms of buoyancy of air, um, humidity, temperature. Um, well, in buoyancy or density of water, it's salt and temperature that make a big difference. Um, another issue to be looking at in this area is the tidal ranges. You can look at many different tidal charts that are available. Uh, this is from February in 2020. The total tidal range is just less than six meters down to a mean low low of negative 1.4. So here they're saying the total tidal range is somewhere close to 7.4 meters according to that chart. If you go up to El Golfo de Santa Clara on the same day, it had a tidal range of 6.9 meters, but the total tidal range is far higher, likely closer to eight meters. Um, the PhD paper on this particular Tidal range is that, and this was back in about 2000, uh, maybe sometime a little later than that. The tidal range uh, in the Northern Gulf is approximately six in, uh, meters, but increases to 12 meters at the uh, mouth of the Colorado River. Now, that is due to what's called tidal amplification. Um, even on here, you can zoom in. on the coastline and let's get rid of the dates. Okay, you can see up in this area, the coastline is smooth and well laid back. Prior to that, you have a longshore type tidal deposition of silts and sands. Essentially, as you move north and you encounter, you know, you get skinny enough in proximity to Montague Island for that incoming tide, the, the water velocity on an incoming tide accelerates through here and moves north uh, into this area. This is about the area where you're looking at uh, a 12 meter tidal range at least. And we're looking in at putting in a two meter tall check dam. 
This is not meant to stop incoming tides. You're not going to do that. Think of a very large wall of water coming in at a significant speed. Um, what you want to do here is definitely talk to a hydrologist, but you want to stay very low, very wide, provide, you know, geo tubes in the middle, rock and rip wrap, stay low. What it's meant to do is to stop so much water from draining out. Um, this will provide us the ability to dredge into this area. And really what we're looking to do is create a two meter tall tide pool that extends from the northern end of Laguna Salada or about the 1987 um, water level where we can provide either up in this area or something like this 14,000 hectares for a already requested um, salt production system. But in order to keep, you know, if we, if that's all we do, this is going to go hi hyper saline, even if we move water north to the Salton Sea. Um, in order to maintain water quality or lack of salinity for our pipeline heading north, we need to create a return system that takes a, advantage of the tidal height differential between here and down here. This provides a gradient and this tidal energy is massive, guys. Um, if you think of, you know, four meters of water moving across a check dam that's, you know, 1,500 meters wide, four meters above that at uh, three meters per second, that's a massive amount of energy. And that energy should provide enough to create a circulation system moving back down in this direction, especially if we dredge this portion deep enough to accommodate. All right, you can see the same type of erosive pattern here um, that exists further north. However, you know, here's the modern day one. And yes, you can see the salt deposition shadow around the increased erosion sort of situation. Salt is accumulating not only everywhere on the floodplain, but it's percolating into the entire water system that is the entire Alto Gopher Biologic Reserve. This is a large scale inland sea based sort of situation that calls for a mitigation of some sort. <clears throat> um, this is one such option. This also provides for a great amount of additional surface area and evaporation. For example, this area right here is about um, 154,000 acres and would actually provide about 1.2 million acre feet per year of evaporation. The energy required to evaporate that, ma that much water on an annual basis is staggering. Um, for instance, Hoover Dam's um, rated with a uh, two gigawatt power rating. If you tried to apply that same basic math to figure out how much energy it would require to evaporate that much water, you'd come up with about 140 gigawatt power rating, about 70 times that of the power generated by Hoover Dam. Um, that's provided by descending Hadley and Pharrell cell air mostly. It is interesting that the northern gulf is kind of protected by a marine boundary layer. This has an evaporative rate of about 3.3 .3 linear feet per year per unit surface area. For Laguna Salada, it's about eight feet. For the Salton Sea, it's about six feet. So 
you can see that there are different energies involved. And we tend, we'd like to use the massive tidal energy to create a circulation system, to take advantage of the massive evaporative system. Yes, we want to deal with the entire area up here. Um, and I look forward to working with many of the experts, especially, well, everywhere through the system on either or both the floating islands or any type of phytoremediation. Um, Real quick, Rob, um, can you jump into the berm again? And we had a couple questions that came up early on about impacts to fish species, um, impacts if we're diverting all the water. Maybe you can just go over that real quick uh, okay. as that's not our intent to have adverse impacts on either of those situations. Okay, real quick, uh, brief calculations show that the tidal flux moving through this direction is 60 to 80 million acre feet per year. Now, some comes in currently evaporates and then flows back out um, let me see if I can find a particular slide. All right. On a higher tide, this is what, so if you get on any one day, say 10 million acre, or not, it's probably not 10 million acre feet. I don't have that number uh, handy right now, but you have a large amount of water moving in and a large amount of water moving out. The tides or the tidal currents in the Northern Gulf, um, these tidal driven currents tend to refract energy off the North American plate and push silts and sands that direction. This is much fresher, less salty water. This is more saline and Nathan, I'm sorry. What was the question again? There were some. Uh, oh, questions okay. That... Yeah, how much? Yeah. I got it. Um, okay, if we have 80 million acre feet a year going in, and mostly most of that comes back out, producing this type of flow, um, what we're looking to do, we only need about 10 million acre feet per year to keep salinity low in our circulation system, less than 40 parts per thousand, probably in the 38 part per thousand range. Um, in this area, we don't need to dredge much to, this is already probably only about three meters high, maybe a little less with a or average sort of floodplain elevation at, a, at, at four with some areas over in here, maybe about five. Um, we don't need much to utilize this region as essentially a tidal pump, allowing large amounts of water to flow in, raise the potential energy of the water, creating a higher water level and utilizing the existing, um, you know, you can see where these channels end. And this is why we're drawing lines from that direction forward. And real, real quick on that. Um, so the Coyote Canal is already existing. You know, that would just be deepened. That doesn't have an environmental impact specifically there. Um, the canals that you're showing in the delta itself are already existing canals, um, I would assume. And so Correct. most of that wouldn't have a negative impact, but specific to the berm, um, you know, the check dam that we're proposing and looking at there, the, can you talk specifically about uh, any, if there's environment? The largest concern is that at present day, you have... 80 million feet per year moving in as far as tidal flux and something less than that moving out due to tidal flux, less evaporation, percolation, other such issues. <clears throat> the main idea is to move about 10 million acre feet through Laguna Salada, maybe 20 million acre feet down through here. 
And you're still going to have very close to 50 million moving back out over the check down. You want to maintain a biologic connection where fish can move in 70, 80% of the time to and from here. You're still going to have low tides um, where, you know, it's very difficult to tell. There's not exactly a whole lot of information as to how high that water level gets at extreme low tides. Um, however, any low tide, or excuse me, any high tide, even as low as 1.5 meters, is still going to overtop that. So every 12 hours, you are going to have some degree of biologic connection over the dam here. And this area down here is going to have, you're actually going to be creating a, not only a biologic connection between here and, and this area and Laguna Salada itself, but this channel may well, you, you may need to put a lock down here somewhere, but you should have relatively free transport from the northern end of Laguna Salada all the way down this channel. And I'm not talking about for big ocean going, um, you know, Panamax type shipping um, ships, but something smaller, certainly barges, certainly something that if you wanted to take salt produced here and ship it out down through there, you could do so. Um, there have been multiple other issues or projects that look to bring pipelines um, like this from El Golfo all the way up, releasing it up here or other ones, which both put them at the extreme north or excuse me, south of the Salton Sea. Sorry about the dog in the background. Um, he's excited to see somebody. Anyways, um, these type of plans without flooding Laguna Salada, using it as shunt for tidal energy, trying to keep waters from rising up onto the salt plain, are going to do nothing to try to mitigate local salinity areas, both in the ocean, but also deposition of salt on the, on the floodplains. This actually does produce an effect that brings in some more fresher water and moves the release point for a lot of salt south of the wave action that tends to suppress it against the Baja Peninsula within the Alta Golfo Biologic Reserve. Um, does that answer the question? I'd like to move on to the um, Salton Sea and wrap this up. Yeah, we got to wrap it up here shortly. So let's jump to the next one. Yeah. And, and okay. just as that caveat, you know, there's more environmental studies, environmental reports, specific analysis that would have to go in in any case. Um, you know, this is just our best our best practices to understand the system as we understand it. So lots more funding and research has to go into our our understanding of it to validate that. Now, right now, um, the Salton Sea Authority is considering the species um, protection habitat um, or preservation habitat habitat in the southern end of the Salton Sea, which would cost about two hundred and six million dollars, and would only provide somewhere in the neighborhood of four thousand acres of habitat. If we were to simply use those dredges talked about in the last um, video or presentation to build, let's say, a berm of that length or even extend it onto here, this would be 
33,000 acres of habitat. Uh, it would be approximately, you know, it'd be less than 10 foot deep on average. Um, but even using 10 feet, that means its volume would be about 330,000 uh, acre feet. In 2019, the cumulative uh, deposition of water from the New and Alamo rivers was about 930,000 acre feet per year, provided we don't drop that below 800,000. Um, you're going to have sufficient inputs to displace existing saltier waters and move it in a counterclockwise rotation into this direction such that we can bring our Im, uh, imports via pipeline or canal. Um, I prefer the pipeline because trying to do a canal through here, you're going to have to line it with concrete to So I think he uh, got cut off real quick. Uh, he was talking about the lining of the canal system. So as to not affect their region. So that is an option. Uh, the pipeline does actually produce more energy and is a little bit less costly. So that's kind of the reason why we're doing that is a predominant uh, strategy here. You can see the uh, salt sink that Rob was about to talk about. That size can be reduced over time or eliminated completely with different technology but this is a passive system to um, add all of the salt that's actually in there, encapsulate it, and then add a uh, new salt accumulation from the ocean water that comes in into that area um, so that you can restore the shoreline of it. So um, do we have any questions? Uh, if anybody wants to jump in, we're gonna uh, transition it over here quickly to um, Mr. Zamora again. Um, any questions from any of the panel? <clears throat> 